Please allow me to welcome all of you, including our speakers, at um, our seminar with the title of public debate, with the title What Europe in 2025, a provocative um, um, title. Uh, before I will move to our topic and to introducing our speakers, I just want to draw your attention that uh, the speakers, all four of the speakers are uh, next to their other roles, also um, members of uh, the board of Prague European Summit, our big annual uh, conference uh, we organize every year here in Prague together with uh, the European Commission uh, and number of other partners. Um, and this, the, the, the next conference will happen in uh, June 2018. You will all get, all those of you who are, who are interested in this, will get more detailed information, including invitations uh, later on. We have a musical accompaniment showing that it's really important. Um, so, so you are all warmly welcome to uh, to the summit, where I'm sure we will discuss all these issues again in great detail. But to just show you what you can expect uh, uh, from from the summit, we succeeded in organizing this public debate with having the 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 cream of the cream, the best of the best uh, in the program board, uh, uh, who will. I hope uh, tell us all, including myself, what we can expect from from Europe. I mean, from, especially from the EU uh, in in uh, in the years to come. Um, starting on my right left, uh, we have Peter Balash here, who is a professor at Central uh, European University in Budapest and a former EU Commissioner. So welcome. Uh, we, we also have Barbara Lipp Lippert, uh, who is um, director of research and member of executive director of the executive board. Am I not no, mistaken? No, not member, executive. member of I'm the executive. Okay, <laughs> member of the executive board at uh, uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, one of the most influential German uh, think tanks and research institutions. So welcome, Barbara. Uh, uh, on my right, we have uh, Stephen Blockmans, who is head of EU foreign policy at um, uh, Center for European Policy Studies. Welcome, Stephen. And finally, last but not least, Pavel Schwerboda, who is deputy head of European Policies, uh, Policies, uh, Political Strategy Center. So welcome, Pavel, as well. Um, and as you, as you notice, uh, the distribution is quite exactly what we need because we have some people who come from uh, from the region, Pavel and, and Peter, uh, from the Visegrad 4, let's say. We have some people who are uh, neighbors, but not members of the Visegrad 4, and some from even beyond. So we have a nice distribution of different views, which will come in handy, as you will see when I'll start asking my questions. So uh, I want to start by very briefly introducing the topic. We are all aware that we are uh, in, a, uh, of course, it sounds a bit as a cliche, but we are at a crossroads in the EU. Uh, there is a clearly felt atmosphere of renewed optimism. This is related to the economic performance of the of the EU. This is related to the migration issue uh, with the number of migrants going down dramatically compared to, to the height of the crisis. And um, there seems to be a new impetus in the EU uh, aiming at reform, at, at deepening, especially at internal, internal reform. And that uh, sounds all very nice, but we should be reminded that it was just a year ago when uh, uh, President Juncker was talking about about uh, a situation which shook the and I'm quoting shook the very foundations of the integration project. So how come that after just one year we can entirely re name, relabel, reframe the situation we, we find ourselves in. Um, and of course, we have a similar 
paradoxical development in the Visegrad Four as well. On the one hand, we have um, uh, growing divergences among the, uh, um, our Central European partners. Uh, you all are aware of the recent uh, comment or statement by Prime Minister Fico of Slovakia, of uh, Slovakia being the uh, island of democracy in, in Central Europe just after our uh, election, uh, and about Slovakia clearly belonging in the core of uh, of the EU. Uh, on the one hand, we had a lot of comments in international media after our election about the uh, emerging axis of evil uh, of uh, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic with with the with the uh, new uh, perhaps new government. Uh, so so we have this double development here regionally as well. Um, so. I want to start by two brief questions. I'd like all of the four speakers to give us their assessment, uh, their answers, and then perhaps I would directly open the floor to your questions and, and discussions, because this is not a series of lectures. It is more a public debate, and we want to engage you, and, and I'm sure our speakers want to hear from you what you think about these issues. So my two questions are very simple. One is related to the title. Uh, the EU in 2025. Do we have a multi-speed Europe, as this seems to be the topic of discussions in, in most EU capitals? Or do we have what uh, President Juncker was talking about, uh, a more united EU? Uh, in his State of uh, the Union, he claimed that the, the that Euro is the currency for the whole uh, EU, uh, and that uh, his dream is to bring bring the member states together, not to create separate institutions for the eurozone, for instance. So that's one question: where where are we heading in 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 in, in general terms? And the second is related to our region, because I think that's something we are also interested in, both from inside the region and outside the region. What is your assessment? What uh, the um, Visegrad Four, uh, the four countries will play in this process. Will they contribute to overcoming differences, or do you think this is just a naive dream which we should should give up and simply put up with the objective reality of of divergences in in the EU? And can we start in the order I introduce the speaker, so Peter, please? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, what about Europe by 2025? I think we could reduce uh, the question and bring the date a bit closer, because we will see already within two years, by 2019, what is going to be Europe in the following six years. Uh, many important events will take place in uh, that year of uh, 2019, new European Parliament, new Commission, a lot of national elections before that date, uh, and uh, heated discussions about the future long-term budget, the Brexit will take place, so I could go on even more things. Uh, this is a, a magic date. Now, uh, for the moment, it's rather difficult to, uh, to read the future. Why? Because we are in an extremely creative phase uh, in the EU. We have got a lot of documents. Uh, even the list is rather long, uh, the, the five scenarios, then the five reflection papers, the Juncker speech, the Macron speech, uh, the, the Tusk uh, uh, agenda. So. Uh, I feel like in a kitchen, when you see a lot of ingredients on the table, fantastic, uh, all what you can imagine, but we haven't started to cook uh, yet. Uh, because one of the main, uh, one of the chief cooks is still missing, and this is called German government. Uh, so uh, we need a German government we know a lot about the French position. Some people guess that the Juncker speech was partly a German message. And I, I can share this view, because if you compare uh, Juncker with Macron, there are obvious uh, conflicts which are so typical for Germany and France. Anyhow, we are in a reflection phase that reminds me 
uh, the European Convention, which was uh, 15 years ago, 2002 and three. Then we were in a very creative phases, but then there was a backwind. Now we are full with problems uh, all around us. Uh, the question is, how can we get out uh, from those problems with a positive solution? I can see a, an optimistic uh, horizon because uh, the hardcore of the EU is more united than before and is having plans. Let's see how they uh, move on. And here I uh, pass the second question. What about our region? Uh, our region uh, is uh, an interesting alliance within the alliance, the Visegrad Four. Uh, usually, such structures are strong if the smaller group is more cohesive than the bigger one. But this time, this is the other way around. So the smaller group is less cohesive than the larger group, uh, because the Visegrad uh, cooperation is based on a single declaration of intentions back from 1991. And the implementation depends always on the governments, what the governments would like to do. And if we have at least two uh, governments uh, starting uh, in the good direction, then they can pull the other two. But for the time being, I have the impression that uh, the most reasonable uh, behavior is from Slovakia, uh, with the backwind of the Eurozone, which was a, a really a heroic uh, uh, act from the Zurinda government. And they failed, of course, because they took on them all the, the difficulties. The three others, well, I don't want to commend the host country, the wonderful Prague and, and uh, uh, the Czech Republic, because uh, uh, nobody can read the future here for the moment, uh, I think. But I can see uh, a distancing of Poland and Hungary from the Slovak position, uh, not in a positive uh, way. So uh, what is very important in that context, and this is my last uh, uh, message, that uh, even if Juncker offered uh, the high speed for everybody with a help, uh, a helping hand for joining the euro, uh, this was a last opportunity, or can be a last opportunity, but it's going to be the choices each and every country where to take place on the first class wagon or the second class. Uh, and then uh, we should uh, bear all the consequences of that uh, choice. So nobody else will point us and order us uh, to a, an outer circle. Uh, this is the decision of the governments which are acting this year, next year, and the over next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, the floor is yours. Tell us about the, you know, so what, so what should we expect from the great mover and Sh shaker of things, the, the, the German government, as we heard from, from Peter. Do you share that view? Uh, not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I try to, to talk a bit about the future, although it's very difficult, uh, in particular, as we've seen, I think, over the last years, that uh, really uh, events uh, which we did not expect uh, are drivers uh, of change. And so I think we should be prepared mm. for uh, everything that will, will, uh, will come. And uh, um, uh, over the last years, I think that it was first Brexit and then uh, Macron, who were perceived as game changers in a way. Brexit, uh, to the surprise of many, uh, uh, um, uh, led to more unity within uh, uh, the EU uh, uh, 27, at least as far as, let's say, defending mm. the acquis, uh, the status mm. quo uh, uh, is uh, uh, concerned. Uh, and Macron, with his, uh, uh, I would say, uh, utterly non-German approach, not to talk about red lines, but about horizons, brought a new mood and tone into the debate, which is more self-confident, which is also, like Peter Baller said, more uh, uh, positive and, and optimistic to really 
talk about uh, the future agenda uh, and challenges of the European Union and not try just to muddle through. So I think that is, that is uh, a starting point. Uh, looking at uh, uh, the future multi-speed uh, EU uh, or more unified EU, I think we have to accept that multi-speed is a reality. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, multi-speed functioned uh, in the past because mm -hmm. it was still an inclusive, by intention inclusive, uh, a process open to those who were willing or able, both, to join and uh, to uh, contribute. So it was not excluding one or the other, uh, uh, in spite of all the, the opt-outs that were granted to some uh, of, the, uh, of the member states. And I think this kind of policy-driven uh, multi-speed uh, approach uh, will also uh, continue and it will definitely uh, continue within uh, the avant-garde groups uh, as far as the Eurozone uh, uh, at least is uh, uh, concerned. But there is also a sense, and at least in, in, in my country, uh, in Germany, that you should not uh, risk to drive differentiation too far. Uh, so there is, uh, of course, I think, a difference uh, between, uh, let's say, the German approach and uh, the more uh, uh, risky approach, I would say, uh, by uh, uh, the French government uh, and Macron when it comes, for example, to deepening uh, uh, the Eurozone, uh, uh, going in a strategic way towards a two-tier kind of, of uh, European Union. That is, as far as I see, also a future government uh, uh, in Germany, not, uh, not uh, the preferred way, and not in the least because of, of course, of history and geography of, of, of Germany and its role uh, in uh, the European Union. And there is a clear preference for consolidation, for keeping the 27 together, and for rebuilding trust in many, in many respects, uh, in bilateral and plurilateral uh, 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 relations. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, in that respect, Germany, also the new uh, German government, will change the overall uh, uh, approach. In the contrary, I expect the next government to invest more and in a more mm. systematic way into bilateral relations. Mm. In Germany, it's always called the smaller and medium-sized <laughs> countries, whoever wants to identify with that, uh, with that group. But it absolutely means that in a situation where the UK is leaving the European Union and we don't have this kind of triangular leadership uh, anymore in the EU. It should not be uh, uh, the two countries, France and Germany, uh, uh, in a way dominating the whole uh, scenery uh, and not listening uh, mm -hmm. to others. So I think there will be uh, a different kind of approach. Uh, whether this will uh, work out fine, I don't know. Uh, the, the German approach also has its risks. Uh, to prefer unity uh, um, because there, there might be a price. And one price has always been to only look for the lowest common denominator, to have a slower uh, kind of pace of, of integration or also uh, cooperation. Uh, and maybe there is also a price to be paid to keep in countries which, from a German point of view, are very difficult when you think of Poland, also of uh, uh, of Hungary, etc. So uh, that will be, uh, let's say, a tricky kind of thing to balance these these different uh, uh, intentions and uh, and interests. Um, but that's my let's say broad view on your two questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Barbara. Let's move to uh, in the order, Stephen. Stephen. Thank you, Peter, um, and thanks again for uh, for having me. Um, but Peter has moved the deadline of 2025 a bit closer, 2029. Barbara suggested that indeed in the last couple of years we've seen events dominate the agenda and it's difficult to predict what type of black swans might be out there by 2025. So let's be safe and just push it back till 2030 
um, <laughs> where we can at least, you know, try and discern a few more structural trends, um, which may be upset, you know, by, by some black swan uh, events, of course, but which at least give us a sense of where Europe might stand um, in, in the longer term. And I think then it becomes quite clear that at least in its position in the world, Europe and the European Union in particular will be diminished. It will be diminished in terms of size of population and it will be uh, diminished in terms of size of the, well, the economy, the, the share of global GDP. And uh, this is of course a result of the uh, the surge of economic, um, the economic surge of, of, of rising uh, of rising states, not necessarily the BRICS as we used to know them. There's not a lot of mortar either between the BRICS, uh, but especially if China. Uh, China will be the global, global powerhouse, economic powerhouse. It is proclaiming already to be the political powerhouse as well of the world uh, in the years to come. Even if its growth may go down, uh, go down a little bit, there's still a lot of untapped potential both in human capital, as well as in uh, as well as in uh, educational, homegrown, uh, domestic resource mobilization within the country itself, that it can steer forward um, uh, on the track that it is chosen for now. And by 2030, economists will uh, will tell you that the on on a global scale their uh, economy will have almost reached double of that of the US and the EU combined and it will represent more the chinese economy is a global share again um it will represent more than any of the rest of the emerging uh, economies now then china is a big player uh, here and it, it defines also uh, Europe's position, of course, in the world and its economic uh, stake. Um, the economic weight of non democratic uh, states in the world will have become bigger, and the geographical location of you know tertiary uh, educational policies, innovative technical developments will have moved away from Europe. Um, and that I think will have um, a manifest impact on the single market as we know it today. And here I would like to distinguish a little bit my, uh, my, my take from what has been said uh, before. The single market is still, to a certain extent, you know, quite homogenous. And um, if you look at it from a legal point of view, in an economic uh, sense, of course, there are mass differences at this moment in terms of economic convergence or dissonance, I should say, between uh, various corners of the European Union, and they're unlikely to have been bridged by 2030. As a result of uh, low productivity rates within the European Union, whereas those of, our, of the other poles in the world, especially China, but also the US, will have marginally uh, risen, and as a result of the working age population, which shrinks in uh, the European Union, whereas they will expand in other parts uh, of the country. Combined with a third factor, which is big public debt. Around 90% still it is predicted by 2030, which means that it's very difficult for European states to actually, well, uh, to, to slowly adapt to, uh, to those realities and change uh, economic policies. They will become, in fact, more vulnerable to inbound investment flows, especially from China. And China is already quite aggressively making inroads, especially in southeastern and eastern Europe, as far as its Belt and Road Initiative is concerned. And the expectation may be that if this continues, and if domestic uh, governments of member states find it more attractive to boost growth at home on the basis of that foreign direct investment will in fact create larger differences between them and other member states uh, further afield to keep the, the fabric of the single market intact. And so my prediction for 2030 would be that unless we take 
the type of policies that are necessary and that are on the table and under discussion at the moment, uh, we have to say, not just from a governance perspective of the European Union, uh, making sure that we do more together so as to reassert our clout on the international stage and speak with one voice uh, in the world, invest in uh, reconvergence of growth models, labor models, and invest heavily in education and uh, R&D, especially in those areas of technological development which will shape the future of labor as we, uh, as we know it. Unless all of that happens in the next couple of years, Europe might be in a very bad shape in 2030, uh, or at least in a weaker position than it is now. Uh, uh, thank you, Stephen, for you know moving our attention a bit from from the internal issues because clearly this this new drive Barbara and Peter were talking about they are mainly focused on consolidation internal consolidation of the eurozone or of the EU as such so the focus is primarily domestic EU internal which of course means and we can see it very clearly the less attention to the neighborhood which suddenly is not perceived suddenly gradually is not perceived as an area of opportunity but mainly as an area from which risks come or security threats come so so this kind of reorientation internal reorientation is important of course because we need to consolidate but of course there are external external developments that do not wait for the eu to settle its own internal disagreement so so i i'm, I'm grateful uh, even though you move the uh, the deadline a bit but that's fine um uh, to uh, look at yeah, and I'm sure we'll come back again to external issues again. But let's hear first uh, what Pavel has to add. Pavel. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would add that Europe has certainly uh, turned the corner. Um, we are in uh, in a period which uh, I think uh, we can credibly begin to call uh, the beginnings of uh, of a golden decade for um, for Europe. Um, uh, I mean, when, you, when we look at uh, uh, Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world, we are growing faster than the US, we have record levels of employment, 30% of global payments are in, in, in Euro. I mean, there is really every reason to be extremely pleased with, uh, with where we are. And of course, it's, it's hard for us because uh, we are just emerging from almost a decade of uh, polycrisis. Um, and we've got used to thinking about Europe in, in rather declinist terms. Uh, but I think that doesn't lead anywhere. That, that doesn't get us um, uh, anywhere. So we should, we should look at the assets which we have in, in Europe. Uh, we sh certainly shouldn't overlook the problems. Uh, but we need to make the best out of this uh, situation. Um, the multi-speed Europe idea, I think, is a, is a distraction. It's a waste of time. Uh, uh, the, the real challenge for Europe is, is about cruising speed, not multi-speed. Um, it's about what we do together, what is our level of ambition, rather than whether some countries do it faster than, than the others. Of course, it will always be the case. We are, we are a very diverse group of countries. We come from very different historical uh, background, so we will we will never be aligned on everything, and no, neither we should be aligned. So, I mean, the, the diversity of Europe is 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 one of its strengths, uh, but but one shouldn't really make too much out of uh, multi-speed Europe. I mean, of course, in some capitals, the the idea has more traction than in others. Uh, but I, I would argue that the dominant uh, paradigm at the moment is to to rebuild the identity of EU 27, the EU that will emerge uh, after uh, the United Kingdom leaves in 2019. Uh, and we are now forging uh, the identity of EU 27. So uh, the very meaning of President Juncker's speech in September to the European Parliament, State of the Union speech, was... Uh, um, an open invitation for everyone to contribute to that uh, relaunch of the uh, European Union as the Union of 27. Uh, uh, and it was, in fact, it was a love letter to Central Europe as well. Uh, there were, I think most of the, the speech was about uh, the initiatives that, uh, that this region uh, could be part of. Uh, and I think it comes from from uh, an understanding that there were certain socialization problems that uh, uh, newcomers experienced in the European Union after joining, because after all, Central Europe was joining 
an EU that had already been formed, that had already had uh, 50 years of experience at that time. So if you don't take part in the shaping of the institutions and mechanisms, you sometimes don't feel to be in, in, uh, uh, fully an, an owner of the process. So what is happening now is that there is, there is a relaunch and there is an invitation for Central Europe to be part of it. Um, um, hence, uh, initiatives such as the, the um, uh, idea of enlarging the Eurozone, such as the enlarging, enlarging of the uh, Schengen area to Bulgaria, Romania, and then, uh, and then, and then further. Uh, so um, from the V4 perspective, uh, what I think uh, uh, it would be the best strategy is to uh, try to see how one could uh, locate oneself in that, uh, in that agenda. Namely, what, what should the region um, uh, ask for and what should the region want to realize at the European re level rather than what it should uh, defend itself against? Eh? Because this defensive framework, I think, has, has dominated for too long uh, thinking about Europe here. Uh, and one example which I would, which I would give uh, as to the area worth looking at from Central Europe's perspective is the services market. Um, um, we have just had pretty difficult discussions about the uh, revised um, posting of workers directive. It uh, caused a lot of controversy uh, in, in Central Europe. It has now been agreed. Um, uh, we will see where um, it, has, it has been has been politically agreed, there is further process ahead, but um, we could argue that this takes care of the level playing fields, um, that this takes care of what uh, many Western Europeans would call social dumping. If that is the case, we can, we can uh, move on to uh, reflect on the deepening of the services market um, uh, in Europe and how to integrate it uh, further. Uh, I think I think Stephen is right that we should keep in mind uh, the longer term perspective because uh, uh, after all what what is what is happening now is uh, uh, both uh, taking care of the legacy of the crisis and then preparing the union to face uh, the challenges of the future and in that future context um, I think three issues are are very important and they have to do with uh, with technology and how we um, handle technology, where the technological revolution uh, is is part of uh, is is human friendly. Uh, it has to do with uh, also fairness uh, and whether uh, the new socio-economic model uh, makes sure that there are uh, opportunities uh, for everyone. And finally, there is the question of sustainability, I mean, where we are using the resources of the planet at uh, at enormous speed and. Um, and we need to uh, take stock of that and, uh, uh, and, and switch to a different uh, paradigm. So these are, these are the real objectives. And I think looking at 2025 or 2030, the question is uh, uh, how Europe should, should embrace that agenda. Uh, so this, this, for me, will be the dominant uh, um, discussion going forward. Uh, another stream of that discussion has to be about preparing for the next crisis, of course, because we have... Uh, uh, we have certain armory, but that armory is much uh, weakened on both the fiscal policy side and the monetary policy side. Um, and, uh, and we need to build Europe's uh, resilience. Um, so just to conclude, I think, I think the real question is whether uh, we will manage to reform this time, not under the pressure of the crisis, but in, in, in good times. Uh, it has rarely happened before, but... Uh, but I think uh, this time could be different. So, and uh, the menu, the agenda is, is rich enough for, for everyone to, to find uh, a project there to, to pursue.